we're talking about what if Jesus was serious and we're looking at the most important message perhaps ever shared on our planet. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. And as I've shared in this series, it was a transformative message for me when I first heard it and actually tried to live this out. If you're here and you follow Jesus, he's actually giving us a new way to live. And if you're still exploring God, you should know that what we're going to talk about today and what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount is far different than what you might see in the news described as churchianity or Christianity. We have an invitation to actually live out a whole new way of living, which is the opposite of being judgmental, hypocritical, overly political, which is what too often we see on the news. It just so happens I shared that I had a chance to be part of the Sermon on the Mount filming for a show called The Chosen. Shared that at the first week of our series. Here's a picture in case you missed it. This was me <laughs> from ancient times. And then uh, it was actually the Wednesday before, that's my daughter next to me there, uh, the Wednesday before the ice apocalypse. It was freezing cold, so they called us the Frozen Chosen. And it just so happened in the middle of this series, I'm in Minneapolis a couple weeks ago, and I run into the director, Dallas Jenkins. And I had a chance to thank him for the show, tell him I was there for the filming, told him what we were doing as a church going through the series and how we're pointing people towards the show. And I thanked him for the message that he sent via video to Mike Papali. He was one of our pastors who died of cancer this past summer, who was probably one of the biggest chosen proponents I knew. And Peter Shank, who knows everyone, knew someone who knows Dallas Jenkins, and I was able to thank him face to face for that video message that meant so much to Mike. And it was really, he's a really pleasant guy. I mean, he even took off his headphones when I started talking to him, which I always find is, a, you know, a kind thing to do. You know, if I wasn't a pastor, I've realized I would be great paparazzi. I'm really good at seeing famous people from a distance. When we lived in Los Angeles, I saw Queen Latifah, Robert Downey Jr., uh, Cameron Diaz, uh, Will Ferrell, Justin Timberlake, and, and it just, I just have a knack for seeing these people. And so I, I, I was so excited to see him, and in many ways, it was almost just a little bit of a God wink. It felt like God just saying, this message is that important, that Keep pointing people towards this new way. See, remember the message of the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus is saying the kingdom of heaven is here. That he actually introduced a whole new kingdom, a spiritual kingdom that is advanced by faith, love, and hope, not through weapons of war. A kingdom that has no boundaries, that involves and invites every people, tongue, and nation. And that we have a chance to bring more of this kingdom into our dark world, a kingdom of light. So today we're looking at if Jesus was serious about heart transformation, then our thoughts, motives, and intentions are deeply significant. Now, if you've been following along in this series, there's a lot of passages you might have heard. Last week we looked at the golden rule before we've talked about some of these more interesting passages and the way that we're organized, by the way, and the reason this is out of order is on the same week that Carlos came and spoke, I was up north sharing this message. And Ricky, who's part of our teaching team, kind of organizes things. I wasn't there when they planned this, but they gave me the week dealing with lust, pornography, hell, <laughs> divorce, <laughs> anger, conflict resolution, all the hardest parts. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. But really, we're going to break it into three important issues that if we don't take seriously, could destroy us. And so the first that we're looking at here is this idea of anger. We're in the section of the Sermon on the Mount where people have found it to be most difficult to take Jesus at his word. His interpretation of these well-known commandments, the Ten Commandments, make the law seem unrealistic or even impossible, but he's not calling us to perfection, but rather to make progress, to grow, to become more like Jesus. We could spend an entire series on each of these, and I would encourage you to go back and reread through Matthew 5 through 7, or if you haven't done it, to do so, and just 
really let your mind imagine living out this way. See, God cares as much about the condition of our heart as our words and our actions. So let's dive in. First, if Jesus was serious, then anger left unchecked is more destructive than we realize. Verse 21, you've heard that it was said to people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do, while you are still with together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you've paid the last penny. Let's look at this a little bit. He's basically saying... The law says don't murder, but I'm telling you, you shouldn't even have murder in your, or your anger in your heart. And even more than that, you should make things right with the person that you're upset with. He, he's calling us to a level of peacemaking that's unheard of in our divided world. You shall not murder. He's actually quoting Exodus 20, 13. But he goes beyond that to point out the spiritual molecule behind murder, and that is anger. He uses this word raka, which is a four-letter word in Aramaic, meaning empty-headed or worthless. In our day and age, maybe more equivalent to the word idiot. It's when you have contempt for another person. You see them as less than worth your attention, unworthy. And then he uses this phrase, you're in danger of the fire of hell. Now, when you and I hear hell, there's a lot of baggage that comes with it. And it's probably more connected to a red devil and a pitchfork or Dante's, Dante's Inferno or horror movies or maybe bad experiences growing up in church. But I, I want to talk about what he's saying here. Hell is the Greek word for Gehenna, which is the Valley of Gehenom, where centuries before, the evil king Ahaz had actually sacrificed his children to the god Baal and led many other Israelites to do the same. By the time of Jesus, it had become a trash heap that was constantly smoldering with fire. Now, this is not explaining away hell. Hell is the absence of God's presence. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus talks of how we have the opportunity to live and experience eternal life heaven on earth and into eternity. But we can also experience hell on earth. And God will never force anyone to be in his presence for all eternity. There is a place where evil goes, that there might be a new heaven and a new earth. We don't have time to unpack hell today. I will refer you to Imagine Heaven by John Burke or Imagine the God of Heaven. In fact, today at one o'clock, we conclude that bonus series for our online campus at live.gatewaychurch.com. You can dive far more into it and discover more. So back to hell. This valley was a metaphor or word picture of evil reaching a boiling point of judgment. As you guys know, I've been going through the New Testament, doing a video devotional on every single chapter and almost done. I'm going to finish and in fact, it's been remarkable as you kind of read the big picture of what you're reading, and not just little verses here or there, but you read the, the entire letter, and then you see it in its context. It's remarkable how God's judgment is often just giving us what we want. Evil tends to destroy evil. Our judgment is the punishment, the consequences of what we've actually chosen freely. So when Jesus is saying you're in danger of the fire of hell, here he's talking about now. You can experience hell on earth. Anger undealt with, unrepented from, can actually destroy your view of people. It can destroy your relationships. It can cause serious consequences. It can be hell on earth for the person who never deals with this anger. Which is why he goes on to say to if you're offering your gift at the altar, verse 23, and there, remember, your brother or sister has something against you to leave and go back to make things right, to be reconciled to them before you offer their gift. Now, this is remarkable because Jesus is speaking in Galilee. This means 
He's talking to people who would travel for days to get to Jerusalem to offer their gift to God. And he's saying, if you've traveled all that way, it's still more important to God that you go back and make things right than you give this gift at the altar. See, God is not into our religious rituals. He wants our hearts. God sees what we often don't, that unchecked anger leads to contempt where we no longer see humanity in another person. Dallas Willard said it this way, in anger, I wanna hurt you. In contempt, I don't care whether you were hurt or not. Or at least so I say, you are not worthy of consideration one way or the other. We can be angry at someone without denying their worth, but contempt makes it easier for us to hurt them or see them further degraded. If you've ever said something like, I don't resist, resent them, I honestly don't even think about them. You're implying that you could care less whether they live or die. You're in danger of this awful place called contempt. When we harden our heart towards one person, it actually affects us. It affects our relationships with others. It even it actually affects our relationship with God. See, no one is invisible to God. All are seen by God as worthy, created in his image. Individuals that he came to rescue by dying on the cross. We should never let anger become septic in our hearts, no longer seeing the image of God in others, seeing ourselves as better than others. And so if you ever find yourself, you're stuck, maybe you don't feel as close to God as you used to be, consider, is there someone with whom you're harboring bitterness? It does affect your relationship with God. You cannot say you love God and hate your brother. And by the way, you can forgive even if they never say they're sorry. Mandela once said that resentment is like drinking poison, hoping it would harm the person who's hurt you. See, some of us have resentment and bitterness that's actually affecting us. Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, not the peace fakers. There's another beautiful verse in Romans 12. It says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. That means there's certain people that may not forgive you. There's certain people that may not say they're sorry, but it's up to you to do your part. And then entrust that person, regardless of the response to you. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Now, there's this interesting thing that Jesus does. He here says, if you've offended someone, go and make things right. But in Matthew 18, he says, if you've been offended by that person, you need to sit down with them. So which is it? Was Jesus confused? Had he forgot he said one? I think he knew that neither of us would want to do it. Neither the person who's been offended nor the offender. So maybe one of us would take the initiative. And by the way, if, if you've never experienced this kind of thing, it's actually really beautiful. I've said this many times about Gateway. This is an incredibly loving community because we are inclusive. Anyone can come and explore God. And we're a place willing to have hard and honest conversations. So you can come as you are, but you do not have to stay that way. And that happens in the context of community. And here's how it should happen. Someone hurts you, someone says something, you should think about it, take it to God, and then go back to that person. And you might be amazed at how often it's just a big giant misunderstanding. Or they didn't realize how you might have heard it. And it could quickly be squashed. But too often what we do is we are offended and then we start telling other people that have nothing to do with the person. Then we might make up with that person later and now these folks all have a bad view of that person. The Bible calls that gossip or slander. And it's in the list of destructive choices that we make. But so many times when I've sat down with someone and said, hey, you may not have meant this, but here's how I took it. It's amazing how quickly it was resolved. Or when someone comes to me and says, hey, I, I, I imagine you didn't mean it this way, but here's what I heard. Oh my goodness, I am so sorry. Just this past week, my daughter's best friend growing up from like seventh grade through 12th grade sent me a really long text, really upset about something I posted online. 
And I'm so glad she did because I was able to text her back and say, oh, I'm so sorry. No, what you're reading is actually from a month ago. It's not recent. And she sent me back, oh, I'm so sorry. Thank you for telling me. That makes me feel much better. You see, what would have been worse is her not coming to me and just assuming something awful about me. But instead, I was able to clear things up quickly and immediately. When we don't sit down with a person who's offended us, we rob them of the chance to make things right. We rob ourselves of the chance to have a healthy relationship. Too often, we try to make peace with those who look like us, vote like us, believe like us. We're supposed to make peace with everyone. Second, we see, we also discover in this message that if Jesus was serious, then sexual brokenness and familial brokenness starts in the mind and heart. Verse 27, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus takes two more commandments. This time, you shall not commit adultery and you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, and he talks about both of them in this context. Now, in Jesus' time, There are many Jewish sources that warned against lust and emphasized women's seductiveness. This is not in the Bible. This is some of the books written about the Hebrew scriptures. But here, Jesus is actually emphasizing that the person who has the terrible thoughts needs to take responsibility and not blame women or blame culture, but look in the mirror and deal with what they're thinking. He's saying that so much of the sexual brokenness and abuse and objectification of others begins with what happens in our hearts. And if we actually choose to battle in our mind to have pure thoughts, honorable, dignified thoughts of other people, then we will have freedom. If we're not careful, we check out thinking, well, Jesus is unrealistic. He's just being idealistic. But he's actually dealing with core human experiences and bringing rightness or righteousness to them. See, the Bible has a lot to say on the beauty of sex and love in the context of marriage. There's a whole book about it called Song of Solomon. Do not read it at Thanksgiving. It's PG-13 or more. Jesus is not downing sexual desire. He's actually bringing guardrails to it. Jesus is not just talking about the physical and physiological reaction that happens when we see someone who's attractive. He's not talking about attraction. Attraction is not a sin. Jesus is dealing with what happens afterwards. He's talking about the second look, the thoughts, the fantasies that develop in our mind and heart. Jesus is talking about with lust is not just the look. It's about objectifying another person, looking at their body and not at them. You know, it's very difficult for us, I think, in this day and age. I mean, when I was growing up, pornography was very hard to find. I mean, I knew where it was at my grandfather's house. But other than that, (laughs) it was not as accessible as it is now. I mean, now you can just stream Netflix, and there are things on there that say mature, but they're really pornography. Some of them, uh, well-meaning folks, referred us to a TV show here or there, and we'll start watching. And I'm usually in charge of fast-forwarding, and I'll hit... I'll mean to hit fast forward, but I'll hit pause in the panic and then hit fast forward and now it's in slow motion. It's a terrible situation. It's just better not to watch it at all. But pornography in all its forms is destructive. It's destructive to our mental health, our relationships, our sexual health, because we are dehumanizing others as objects of self-gratification instead of seeing them as image bearers of God. Rather than dehumanizing others, we can actually learn to see people the way God sees them, created in his image, worthy of dignity and value. And if we can win the battle in our mind, we won't fall emotionally or physically. I cannot tell you how many couples I've met with over the years that actually... We're in a terrible crisis. They never expected to cheat on their spouse. They never expected to have an emotional affair on their spouse. They never expected to become addicted to pornography. But if they could move the battle 
to the mind, stop it here, they would avoid what comes later. As I mentioned earlier, the Sermon on the Mount changed my life. And it was this passage in particular that really inspired me to take my thoughts captive, to honor God with my mind. I mean, if you grew up in America, you grew up in a hyper-sexualized world in which somehow we've begun to think that sex equals love and that in order for us to find happiness, we need to find the right person. None of those things are true, by the way. Instead, looking for someone that you can spend your life with or being content in singleness as a calling. And so when I was following Jesus kind of early on, I was in college and I decided to really take Jesus seriously about taking my thoughts captive. And so anytime I'd see a beautiful girl, I would pray for her. I, I would pray that God would bless her and I would begin to pray for whoever my wife might be. And I would pray that no one would look at her the way I was tempted to look at this other girl. And then I would quote this verse, Matthew 5, 8, the pure in heart will see God. And I would use it as a promise. God, you promised that if I will purify my heart, then I could see you. I could experience your presence, your peace, your goodness. You know, there's no better way to get out of a lustful mood than to pray. <laughs> That'll get you out of that mood real quick. And God can guide us to start afresh, regardless of what's happened in the past. See, without fully knowing what I was doing, the action I was doing was actually upholding that young woman's dignity and humanity instead of going down the road of objectification. So back to the hillside with Jesus. Imagine being on that hill and hearing Jesus say these words. Verse 29, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. If it, if it is better, it is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. By the way, did you hear that baby laugh when I said, <laughs> throw the, thrown into hell. Good thing they don't know what we're talking about, right? <clears throat> but I want you to imagine being the first people to hear this on the planet. Like, wow, Jesus is saying, I shouldn't commit adultery, but I shouldn't even have lust in my heart. And now he's saying it's better to gouge my eyes out. I will be blind. <laughs> That's the catch. But actually, Jesus is using hyperbole to make his point. That our minds are so powerful that it's destructive to us if we don't take it seriously. He's not advocating self-mutilation or hurting ourselves with shame. He's saying, deal with your issues now so that it does not lead to destruction. Everyone can easily fall victim to this. Paul says to run away whenever we're tempted. 1 Corinthians six eighteen says, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. In other words, before you bring hell on earth for yourself or for others, win the battle in your mind. You know, there's so many memoirs coming out from famous people, and they're sharing about their sexual exploits, their previous relationships, and the underlying message seems to be broken hearts. See, the beautiful thing about God is he offers each of us a chance to restart. And by the way, if you're feeling any sort of shame or condemnation, that is not from God. God is offering you a chance to start afresh. And it simply begins with, God, forgive me and help me live this differently. Maybe it's today that you choose to honor your body and others' bodies, and in doing so, you will protect your heart. Jesus is saying some really incredibly important yet impossible things that we could not pull off without his help. And that's the point. His invitation is to live a life that's so different than the rest of the world that people see that in us and want what we found. And we can say, oh, 
That's because of Jesus helping me. If you've ever been through divorce, you know that's another experience that's like hell on earth. So Jesus starts with anger, moves towards lust, knowing that these two things can mix to destroy relationships. You may never have murdered someone, but you have probably killed a relationship. He's inviting us to have healthier relationships, even when it comes to one of the most tragic experiences some of us have had. Verse 31, it has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Now, it's important to understand the context of what's happening here. In that day and age, only men could file a certificate of divorce. And in their culture, they had a list of acceptable reasons. Again, this is not in the Bible. This is their own interpretations of it. One of those reasons to divorce could be you don't like her cooking. So Jesus is speaking out against that. Some of you, some of you did not like that, right? as you shouldn't. That's not okay. Jesus goes after men in particular in this moment. It's a great example of how Jesus is actually seeking to protect and provide for women in a culture where they've been oppressed and overlooked. In other words, what he's saying is don't be so flippant with the person you've committed to spend the rest of your life with that you dream of a life without her. In doing so, you've already started cheating on her in your heart. See, Jesus was connecting these issues because they're connected in real life. The battle begins in the mind. It's making the right choice here that keeps us from actions that will destroy us or destroy our relationships. And then verse 33, if Jesus was serious, then the follower of Jesus must choose integrity in our words. Do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you've made. Do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven or for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black, or grow one. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. In those days, people would say, I swear by the goddess of this, or I swear by the god of that. And he's saying, just Be honest. Let your yes be yes, your no be no. Jesus is saying, don't bring anything else into this, but be able to stand on your word. Ecclesiastes 5 says, it is better not to make a vow than to make one and not fulfill it. Jesus is saying, heart transformation. If he was serious about heart transformation, then our thoughts, motives, and intentions are deeply significant. Quick story from my time in Los Angeles. I remember at one of our breakfasts at the pastor's house, somebody asking, is this a grace church or a law church? And he was asking that question because it was with regard to the issue of tithing. Tithing is giving 10% of your income, and it's part of what is described in the Old Testament and also in the New Testament. But, But what he meant by that is, you know, do you go by the the law or here is it, you can do whatever you want, grace. And the pastor, Irwin, says, oh, we're a grace church. The law says, do not murder. But I tell you, you shouldn't even have anger in your heart. The law says, do not commit adultery. But grace says, you shouldn't even have lust in your heart. The law says, give 10%. But grace says, you can give 15, 20, 30, 40, 50%. Because grace is never less than the law. And I love that idea. Grace is never less than the law. Whatever you've experienced, whatever mistakes you may have made, whatever has happened to you, whatever you might be bringing into this place of regret or shame or condemnation, let Jesus wash all that away. See, grace is his unconditional love that he pours out on you regardless of the decisions you've made or things that have happened to you and your response to it. 
And it's because of his grace, out of gratitude, that we want to live a new life. We want to have lives where we honor and dignify others, where we seek to live at peace, where we work on health and our relationships, where we become children of the light in a dark world. The band is going to come and lead us in a song, a chance for us to reconnect our hearts to him. Perhaps in your own heart, confess anything that has come to your mind and troubled you or bothered you or an area that you've been struggling to overcome. And I want to invite you in this Christmas season to come every Sunday. You're not out of town or sick. If you're sick, watch online. But come each week in this Christmas season and allow God to do a work in you, to heal you so that in the new year, you'll be at your absolute best for what he has for you. We cannot live out what Jesus describes without his help. And he invites you in this moment to call out, God, I need you. Help me. Help me start afresh. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love, your goodness, your grace. Thank you, thank you that you call us to a life beyond the norm. But God, we cannot pull this off without your help. So in this room, God, I pray every woman, every man, every young adult, every student would just sense your love for them right now. And if there's any regret or shame, God, that it might lead to confession, acknowledging we need your help. We need your forgiveness. We need a new start. God, may we not just take your words seriously. May we take our spiritual life, our relationship with you seriously, God. Transform us from the inside out that we may experience more of your presence and peace and bring that to everyone in our lives.